Let's start. Okay. So last week we were talking about the process of salinization. How do we classify in general saline soils by their origin, if they are human made or not? Yeah. And in both situations, if they are human made or natural salinization, what is the origin? of that soil salinity. How can it come to be? What are the processes? If the processes are human-made, it's due to our human activities. But naturally, in many situations, there is also natural soil salinity. So counterintuitively, what we were saying last week was, please come in. Counterintuitively, last week we were saying that primary salinization or natural salinity, it's the most common one. Yeah, it's more common worldwide in area to have natural salinity than to have human-made salinity. But for our concern on this course, we are more concerned about secondary <coughs> salinization because this is the pollution we are creating and we need to avoid making this pollution. In many cases, we need to reduce that pollution. We need to go back and recover those soils and mitigate that contamination that we have caused. Yeah. So from where the salt comes from, always coming from the mineralization of the, the, the chemical weathering of minerals. And chemical weathering of minimal, minerals is what leads to the generation of the salts that will accumulate on the soil. And always the salts are accumulating because there is a excess of evaporation with regards to infiltration. Yeah? If there's more water coming through the soil, the water will bring the salts down. It will leach the salts in the soil. But <clears throat> if you have an excess of evaporation, then it will be that the salts will accumulate on the surface. Let's move around different causes here. <clears throat> so from the human made, we have actually separated last lecture in two different types, yeah? Two different types of human made salinity. The first one is dry land salinity. Dry land salinity meaning that is not related to irrigation. This is what we Say it's dry land, you no? Know, because we are not doing irrigation. That's why the name dry land comes from. So dry land salinity is also very, very widespread in countries like Australia, for example. Yeah. And how does it come to be? Is normally because you change the vegetation. You change the vegetation, and therefore there's a change on water table, salt transport, and accumulation. So if you change the vegetation, in this case, there's a forest, this example, and you change it for another vegetation, or if you chop the forest down, rainfall will bring salts, and there's going to be an accumulation of salts in different conditions. So dry land salinity is related to what happens if you just manipulate the landscape in the wrong way. Yeah? What happens if you manipulate the landscape in the wrong way? And there is irrigation. This all, all, all talking about dry land salinity, the same thing. And also water transported or uh, irrigation related. Yeah? And in these cases, we have uh, uh, different types of irrigation causing different types of distribution of salt in the soil. In this case here, the picture is showing the drip irrigation. Please come in. The drip irrigation here creates this pattern in where you have like this uh, circular distribution of salts. Where the drip is coming is the source of the salts. The salts are coming from the water and by capillarity, those salts are moving around and accumulating in circles behind. It gets to a point that it will affect the plant because you're limiting the space and where the plants can grow. Yeah? If you have this salinity that will kill the roots on this part, you only have a small part in which the plant can grow. How do you deal with this? We're going to see later on, but every, periodically, every year, let's say, you need to wash the whole soil. Not only do drip all the time, 
but you you need to come here and give like a, let's say a sprinkler irrigation yeah and it will moisten all the area but do a lot of irrigation so the water will move the salts and leach the salts down if you only do drip with poor water quality at some point you will get these patterns and have the salinization happen yeah and also with other sources of irrigation you get uh, different patterns of distribution if you have poor water quality and if you're doing irrigation with poor water quality at the end if you're not considering the leaching of the salts you will have a problem you will create that problem <clears throat> Now, the question is, what is the care that I must have when I'm doing irrigation? Should I close the door? We have a problem that is both excess of irrigation and too little irrigation. If you want to save water too much, maybe we will have a problem because of the lack of irrigation. If we don't add in enough water, we are not creating the leaching. So the water is not bringing the salts down and you're concentrating the salts on the top. Now, if you add too much water, what you do is the water table goes up and the water table going up, it means there's more capillarity and accumulation of salts going up, okay? Water table coming up can happen in some situations, even if you're careful. Even if you're doing it properly, you may have poor drainage and the water table will go up and there you have the problem of shallow water table. In these situations, you must use artificial drainage. You need, you need to install artificial drainage to deal with the salinity. Okay, so this is showing too little irrigation and here in the case could be too much irrigation. Yeah, so this is two situations that you could be having like this. We will look at this in the management side of soil salinity, that you have different patterns of distribution in the soil, where the salts accumulate, depending on the type of irrigation that you are doing. Okay, and here is artificial drainage showing uh, the installation of artificial drainage in the field where you have the lowest part, where you have the most shallow water table, you can put uh, artificial drainage to carry those out away. Yeah? And then we stopped here, which was when we were going to talk about seawater intrusion. Seawater intrusion, we classify that as also man-made because normally it happens, let's say this is the natural condition, okay? The seawater has an interface between what is the saline water that is in the pore water here and also the fresh water that is coming with the aquifer, naturally coming with the aquifer. And there is this interface where the aquifer is constantly pushing that water into the ocean, constantly pushing that water into the ocean. Now what happens, the, what, what is the human-made component here, please? please come. Human-made component in this sense is when you start pumping, yeah? Other things will happen also, but the, the case that is very often happening is you start pumping inland. If you pump inland, you create this. The head of water now can become higher in the ocean water than in, in the inland, so you encourage this interface to move further inside. And that could be made in cascade, okay? If you're only pumping up here, if you're only pumping up here, nothing happens, yeah? But if you start pumping here, you contaminate this part, and then you start pumping up here, then it moves, yeah? Maybe if you only started up here and you didn't do anything else, you, you, you wouldn't have a problem. But if you do it like, first you contaminate, then you move, then you contaminate again, and then you move. By this cascade effect, what you're happening is you're creating more and more contamination due to the seawater intrusion. 
These are some of the causes that could cause seawater intrusion. Natural causes, sea level rise, subsidence, decrease in, in recharge. But human-made often is increase of pumping extraction. This is almost always the case. Yeah? Coastal areas, what you have human activities, they're pumping for irrigation or for human consumption, and then you create seawater intrusion. These are some of the factors that affect uh, seawater intrusion, the soil type, the bedrock type, the thickness of the buried zone, and uh, topography. Yeah, so this is the illustration now of what usually happens. You pump inside and then you encourage the saline water interface to move inland, and that is what constantly happens. So what I want to start focusing now is what are the indicators? How do you measure this? How do you know that the origin is coming from seawater intrusion or if it's coming from other sources of salt? You, know? you need to look into the composition of the water. There are some indicators. Everything that is on the composition of the seawater in that site could be an indicator that is a trace for you understanding that the seawater intrusion. So, Concentration of sodium, of chlorides, bottom, and sulfate are taken as indicators. Yeah? Many times, your aquifer is very poor in sulfate, but the seawater has a high concentration in sulfate. So if you see a spike in sulfate, that means it's an indicator that's coming from the seawater. Other things like bottom and chloride also are very good indicators. Sometimes your soils will already contain high sodium, and then the, the majority of the natural salinity coming from the aquifer is sodium. And if you compare sodium, it's just that the levels are going up and down, but that does not make a good tracer for the source. But if your water, your brackish water, is more dominated by calcium ions and less of sodium, sodium can also be a good indicator that the water is coming from the seawater. The contamination is coming from the seawater, okay? So here are some of the indications, chloride to, to bottom uh, bromate ratio. Yeah? It's one of the things that you can measure. Chloride is always, uh, normally is what you use it in most times. And if you make a correlation, you will, uh, and let's say if you do it in our batina, you will see the more you have seawater intrusion, the more you have salinity, the more you have chloride. So it's a very good correlation, it means it's a good indicator for um, measuring uh, salinity and establishing that the origin of the salinity is actually coming from the seawater and not from other sources. All right, so how do we measure soil salinity in general? And how do we classify soils about the salinity? How do we measure soil salinity? You have here four parameters. You've probably seen them before. Yeah? ESP, SAR, is about sodium. pH, you know what it is. pH is the concentration of hydrogen. And EC is the electrical conductivity of the water. So let's detail a little bit more what these are. Yeah? pH, whenever you have salinity, it's actually accumulation of bases. The majority of the, the, the cations that you will have, they are not, most likely, not acid cations. They are not aluminum, they are not iron, and they are not hydrogen. All the rest of the cations are bases, all right? So, when you, whenever you have salinity, the tendency is pH goes up. Yeah, so, monitoring pH is also an indication of salinity. Alkalinity and salinity, they go together. The more salinized an area is, the more you expect to be alkaline. Sodium and pH also have a relationship. When you increase some of the ions, like calcium, magnesium, 
you get pHs up to 8, 8.5, but you get pHs really, really high, like 9, you need to have sodium. So if you cross some thresholds, it's an indication that your predominant ion is actually sodium on the system. We will talk about this in soil chemistry and soil salinity. Electrical conductivity. Why do we correlate electrical conductivity with salinity? What is electrical conductivity? The amount of salts? But exactly what it is, yeah? We, the information is, the higher the electrical conductivity, the higher the amount of salts. But what is electrical conductivity? How much water can conduct electricity? Yes, the ability of any medium could be water or any solution to conduce electricity. You can measure electrical conductivity in the soil matrix with soil particles also. It doesn't have to be in water. Yeah? But in this case, we are talking about solution. Why it is that the higher the salinity, the higher the electrical conductivity, directly proportional? It depends on the ions. The ion concentration. So electrons will move in the solution, not by the water molecules. It moves in the solution through the ions. It can jump around through the ions. So. If you have more ions, more salts, then the electrons move faster. You have more ability of the media to conduce the electricity. It's the inverse of the resistivity. How much it resists electrical current, it's the opposite of conductivity, yeah? So this is the, we normally never think about it like a, for what it is, we always, as, take it as a direct measurement of salinity, of salt concentration. But actually, it is an indirect measure. This is not a concentration in milligrams per liter of something. It's not a concentration, not a direct measurement of salinity. This is indirect measurement. But it's so good, so linear, so we always take it for granted that it is a measurement of soil salinity. Mm -hmm. Sodium adsorption ratio and exchangeable sodium percentage. This is now talking about not how much salt you have, but within the salt that you have, what is the proportion of sodium? So why do we care about sodium more than we care about calcium, magnesium, potassium? Why sodium? It's very common to be very high, to be the predominant ion. Okay, this is one. But what is the effect it causes in the soil? What's the problem with sodium? Easy connect with uh, Easy compete with? Connect with uh, change with the... Uh... Actually, it does, it does not have an easy, easy, does not have a high affinity for the solid phase. and does not form precipitation very easily. So you do not form precipitates of sodium very easily like you form with calcium. Calcium phosphate binds precipitate very quickly. Sodium phosphate always is dissociated, yeah? Sodium and potassium are very soluble. They're, they do not complex very easy with the clays or with other uh, counter ions. But why do we care about sodium? What is the problem with sodium? Why sodic soils are problematic, especially problematic? <clears throat> because it uh, moves another, uh, like, uh, another cadmium from the soil? The it comes uh, because sodium is monovalent, like potassium. It has only one charge, yeah? Only a, one positive charge. When sodium binds, let's see if we have this in the slide here, ahead, okay? Let, yeah, here. Calcium is divalent, yeah? has two positive charges. Calcium can bind to one clay and at the same time can attract another clay. Or even bind to a phosphate that can bind to another calcium that can bind to another clay. So therefore, calcium, magnesium can flocculate, can create soil structure. 
calcium and magnesium, because they are polyvalent cations, they can hold different colloids together and create soil structure. Sodium, potassium, hydrogen, they cannot do it because they are monovalent. They only have one positive charge. Then they bind to the clay and they prevent that clay from interacting with another clay. All right? What happens when you have this problem? When you have an excess of monovalent cations, what happens? There's no interaction. What happens? The soil loses the structure. If the soil loses the structure, you have a problem with infiltration, you have a problem with irrigation, hydraulic conductivity, and it makes it very hard for you to leach the salt, to remove the salt in the soil because it becomes a compacted soil, a compacted mass. And if it's compacted, it's very hard for you to remove those salts, to, to remediate that salinity. So excess of sodium is especially damaging. It would be the same thing if you have an excess of potassium, but almost never you have an excess of potassium. Potassium will never come to the situation where you have too much potassium and then you will have a, a potassic soil. Yeah? But you have often a sodic soil yeah? because sodium is more common. Yeah? How do you measure? You have measure in two ways. Sodium absorption ratio, you divide the sodium concentration by calcium and magnesium, yeah. and will give you the proportion. Yeah. If you have more sodium, the calcium and magnesium, at a certain level, you have a problem of excess sodium. And also, you have the... Where is the... It's out of order here. Ex exchange sodium percentage, what is the calculation? It's not here, yeah? Exchange sodium percentage. Anyway, the ESP also is a, is a measurement for the sodium saturation. The only difference, the formula is, instead of dividing by calcium and magnesium, now you will divide by the cation exchange capacity, okay? In this when you divide by the cation exchange capacity, now what you're saying is the total charge of the soil, how much of it, the total charge of the soil, is compensated by sodium ions. Yeah. And now when you do it like this, you're not saying the total charge of the soil, you say the total part of the ions occupied by calcium and magnesium. So it's a different way of expressing, but they mean the same thing. Yeah. ESP and SAR will tell you what is the percentage of sodium with regards to the other bases? And the higher they are, the more problematic you have the sodium part. The sod you have more problems with sodium. Oh yeah, here is the, the formula I was looking for. The catch and exchange capacity. Yeah. Instead of using calcium and magnesium. If you have the catch and exchange capacity, I consider this to be more and more adequate measurement of the sodium abundance or the sodic problem in the soil than the other one, but both of them will give you similar results, yeah? Similar results. So you have soil which are non-saline, non-sodic. You have saline soils which are not sodic. You have sodic soils which are not saline and you have saline sodic soils. Here you have the problem of high amount of salt that causes the plant to lose water. There is a hydraulic problem with the plant. They cannot uptake water. Here you do not have that problem. You only have the problem with the structure of the soil. If you have a sodic soil that is not saline, the plants are not suffering to uptake water but the structure of the soil collapses and then it becomes very unfertile, yeah? a poor soil. This is uncommon, yeah? Either you have this or you have saline sodic soil. It's very uncommon that you have only sodic soils without having salinity involved, but it's possible. Uh. 
So saline soils, it's what you find mostly in Oman. You have little problem of sodium in Oman. Why you have little problem of sodium is because you have, the soils are very calcic. Already you have a lot of carbonates, 10% carbonates, 15% carbonates. That means the dissolution of the carbonates gives a lot of calcium to the solution. And the proportion between calcium and sodium, even when you have high sodium, you also have high calcium. And that balances out, that is not a problem of sodicity. Most of the time what you have in Oman is just salinity, but not saline sodic soils, okay? Some special situations you could have, but in general, that's not the case. Normally, it's only saline soils. So, how do you know it's saline soil? Electrical conductivity over four. Electrical conductivity over four, that's when you classify the soil as saline. Why is that? Because this is usually we're going to talk about how you ca categorize plants for their tolerance for salinity. Most crops over four will have a significant decrease on the yields. If they decrease the response, the productivity, then you consider that you have a problem. If it's affecting your plants, you have a problem. So in general, four decimals per meter on the saturated base is how you have that you know that you have a saline soil, a problem with salinity. Yeah. ESP, the threshold is 15, and SAR is 13. If you have, B, uh, if you have above that, it's uh, sodic soils. So saline soils that are not sodic, normally they will have below 15 for ESP and 13 for uh, ES, uh, SAR. pH values, normally they do not cross 8.5. When they are higher than 8.5, it's usually an indication that you have sodium. When it's very high, it's usually because you have too much sodium. Saline soils, they will be 8, 8.2, 8.4, 8.5. So this is normally where you find money soils, sometimes over 8, but rarely over 8.5. Some special situations where there is too much salt, it will cross 8.5. The most abundant ions will be calcium, magnesium, and the anions will be uh, chloride, sulfate, and carbonates. Yeah. The physical conditions are not affected because you do not have the sodium problem, but you do have the problem of the availability of water for the plants. Sodic soils, now, without salinity, the problem is the structure of the soil. Yeah. The structure of the soil. If you do not have salinity, here's a case where you probably have a saline solid, because you can see the stain of salts in the soil. That's already an indication for this picture. It's not only sodic soil, it's saline solid. But in sodic soils, you would not see evidently too much salt on the surface. You only see that the, the structure is collapsing. It means your soil becomes very compacted and very easy to, to uh, become with high density. And therefore, you have a problem for doing irrigation. Your plants, the, the roots will die uh, because of the, the, the structure collapse. Yeah. And also, it's typical when you have too much sodium that you create some dark spots because of the dissolution of the colloids the organic colloids will be lighter, they will be less dense. So when you precipitate them, the, they, they have the organic colloids on top, so you can have dark spots in the soil. So if you see dark stains, usually, typically, it's involved in soil uh, sodicity. Also in saline sodic, you can see the same thing, saline sodic soils. The criteria is ESP over 15, but this uh, uh, EC below four. So we're talking about only sodium problem, not salinity problem. Yeah. Sodic soils, they are not saline, but they're solid. Yeah. So EC below four, ESP uh, above 15, SAR above 13. 
These are uncommon, yeah? Uncommon, the sodic soils are uncommon. What you will find more often is that you have either saline soils or saline sodic soils, but sodic alone, not very common. Sodic soils are so you may have uh, toxicity, iron toxicity for plants. The sodium in itself and the chlorides, they can be toxic for plants and they can have a, you can have this toxicity issue. <clears throat> so saline sodic, now you have the combination of two problems. You have EC over four and you have high ESP and SAR. Yeah, together, the two things will happen. And you have the combined, also the two negative effects of salinity and you have the combined negative effects of sodicity in the same situation. EC over four, ESP over 15, and SAR over 13. In this case, you can get uh, 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 pH over 8.5. It's, it's generally less, but can increase. The more the sodium, the higher the pH, yeah? Sodium will always condition the pH. So there you go. This is the table that you need to carry with you. If you have no problem, EC below four, SAR below 13, and ESP below 15, yeah? Structure of the soil is, uh, uh, is contained. Salinity alone, which is normally what you find in Oman, you have EC above four, uh, SAR below 13, and ESP below 15. Structure, you can still find a structure. Uh, sodic soils, you do not have salinity problem, you only have a sodium problem. So EC below 4, SAR be, uh, above 13, and ESP above 15. So the same thing goes, saline sodic, it's just a combination. Yeah? You have more than 4 and high ESP. Can you repeat the differences between sodium and sodium? I mean, it's Yeah. Here you go. Sodium absorption ratio is, they are actually measuring the same thing. Yeah? What you want to express when you have a, a sodium problem is, it comes to a point when you have too much sodium ions. But it's not a matter only if you have too much sodium ions. It's the competition between sodium, calcium, and magnesium. You remember, um, we'll talk about that further in soil chemistry. Yeah? but there is an exchange affinity between these ions and the solid phase. It means some ions are more strongly held by the solid phase than other ions. And sodium actually is the one with lowest affinity. If you have calcium and magnesium, almost always attached to the clay will be calcium and magnesium and not the sodium. The sodium will only attach to the solid phase when you do not have calcium and magnesium, okay? Calcium and magnesium has higher affinity. Yeah? You remember what is called the lyotropic series. You remember that from introduction? We will bring these concepts again when we talk about salinity and soil chemistry. Now, so it means that if you have a lot of sodium, you will only have a problem if you do not have enough calcium and magnesium. So you want to measure not only the... If we were caring only about sodium, you take it as PPMs of sodium, concentration. What is the concentration of sodium? And that will reflect sodicity. But the sodicity for us is not about how much sodium you have. It's how much the relationship of calcium, magnesium, and sodium. Do you have enough calcium and magnesium to mitigate the sodium problem? All right? So the information coming from SAR and ESP is the same information. The calculation is different, yeah? You do SIR when you do not have the cation ex exchange capacity. Then you just measure the concentration, sodium, calcium, and magnesium, and you calculate. If you have the cation exchange capacity, it's better to use the ESP.
So this one is divided by the square root of calcium magnesium over two. And the other one is divided by cation exchange capacity. The numbers will be very similar. Yeah? One gives a little bit higher than the other one. And the, the information is the same. The information that you have from both measurements is the same information. It's how much sodium do you have with respect to the other ions. It's a percentage of sodium, let's say. And what you want to know is, actually, if this is becoming too high, like 10 times more, let's say, then you will have uh, a problem, okay? If you have much more sodium than you have calcium and magnesium, then the sodium will displace calcium magnesium and the structure of the soil will collapse. If it's the opposite, if you have enough calcium and magnesium, the calcium and magnesium will take the priority to bind to the solid phase and therefore it will be creating the structure of the soil. So sodicity is a problem of soil physics, okay? Not a problem of soil chemistry. It's a chemical effect that disperses the colloids, but what happens, the problem is the structure of the soil is collapsing and therefore you have a problem with the infiltration rate in the soil. Um, more questions? This is understood? Yeah. Okay. In Oman, you do not expect to have sodicity. You may have high concentration of sodium, but also accompanied by high concentration of calcium and magnesium. So normally you do not have sodic soils. They're not common in Oman. 